Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, I know it's evening, and thank you for joining the session today. Um, today, we're going to talk about dynamic large scale Spark on Kubernetes with Argo workflows and Argo events. Um, before we kick off this session, I would like to check how many of you are currently running Spark on Kubernetes today. Yeah, not Great bad. Uh, how many of you are using Argo workflows today? For any type of hardware, right? Thank you very much. That gives, um, probably you can take away some of the uh, uh, points from this session today. Um, my name is Vara Buntu. I'm a principal solutions architect working for AWS. Uh, I'm specialized in data analytics and Kubernetes. And today I have my colleague, Ovidu. Hello, everybody. Yes. I'm very excited to be here. My name is Ovidio. I'm a container specialist solution architect at AWS. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to have this uh, presentation together with my friend Vara in front of you. All right. Thanks, Ovidio. Uh, without further ado, let's get started. Uh, that's not working. OK. Sorry. <laughs> right. Um, just a quick agenda. Uh, we're going to talk about I'll give you a little bit of intro for anyone who doesn't know about Spark on Kubernetes, but just an introduction to Spark on Kubernetes. And then we move on to why, you need, why customers want to run Spark on Kubernetes. And, uh, and we discuss about some of the best practices for running Spark on Kubernetes. And especially and today's talk is about, you know, when it comes to running a large scale Spark on Kubernetes, what kind of considerations and the best practices that you need to uh, consider before deploying your workloads onto Kubernetes. So we'll touch upon those best practices. Um, and uh, we also talk about Argo workloads and Argo events, like you know some of these data pipelines that you're building. Um, you need to ensure that these data pipelines are running on specific schedulers or, or workflow engines. And uh, we will dive into the Argo workloads and Argo events. And finally, the demo, we prepared a demo that will showcase how you can actually create a DAG with multiple Spark jobs and trigger those Spark jobs using both Spark operator and Spark submit as well. So that's what we are planning today. So let's get started on the Spark on Kubernetes. So as you see on the slide, um, as you all know, Apache Spark is a distributed processing framework and which is mainly used for processing terabytes and even petabytes of data at a very large scale with both unstructured, even structured data. For Apache Spark, it comes with a set of libraries such as Spark SQL, uh, MLlib, Streaming, and Graphics. It's mainly for various data processing, such, such as uh, data processing, machine learning, and real-time data processing, and uh, graph data processing. So these set of libraries that you can use to process various set of data. And you can run Apache Spark on a standalone machine, such as your Windows machine or a laptop. Um, but to run Apache Spark on a distributed mode uh, to process terabytes of data, that is when Apache Spark needs a resource manager, such as Hadoop, you might be familiar, uh, Hadoop Yawn, and Yawn is used as a resource manager to uh, actually distribute that uh, executors across these instances and run your workload. Uh, but then, uh, in 2018, that's when uh, Apache Spark added a support uh, for Kubernetes as a resource manager. That means you can actually run uh, Spark workloads onto Kubernetes um, now, um, you know, uh, with that version. Uh, that's when the shift started. Customers have started to think about, uh, you know, we want to migrate our existing workloads into Spark on Kubernetes now, and how matured it is, and because of all the scalability features that uh, Kubernetes offers. So why Spark on Kubernetes? Uh, that probably that's a common question that everybody asks, and I know, um, most of you know about Kubernetes because you're here. Uh, Kubernetes, it's a very powerful container orchestration tool which you can uh, use and leverage some of these features. One of them is dynamic scaling, right? You can leverage, you can run your Spark workloads, bursty workloads from zero nodes to thousand nodes uh, when you trigger the job, and you can scale down when you don't want to run the jobs using cluster autoscaler or carpenter um, in using the auto-scaling features. Portability allows you to actually write your Spark job and containerize it and run it on any type of Kubernetes flavor of the cluster, right? So uh, you can use uh, EKS, GKE, or even on-prem Kubernetes clusters and should work. 
and resource isolation. It's one of the key feature uh, within the Spark. Like you can define every single job can have its own CPU and memory definition. That way you are ensuring that your job doesn't take more than that CPU and memory that you allocated. So that gives you that resource isolation, ensures that every job gets its own quota of the job. And it's a cloud diagnostic, right? So you can develop the script, and if you think about migrating onto from on-prem to more cloud-native tools like you know uh, EKS or GKE, any other uh, Kubernetes uh, solutions, you can run it. Um, and the multi-tenancy, uh, one of the key features about running Spark on Kubernetes is the multi-tenancy, right? So you can have namespace isolations, so multiple teams can share the same cluster and run the multiple burglars. And running multiple versions of the Spark, I think this is the one of the key feature. Um, when you're using Hadoop, you might have that situation that you have to create a dedicated Hadoop cluster for every single Spark version. But with Kubernetes, you can use the same Kubernetes cluster, such as EKS in this case I'm talking about. Uh, you can have multiple versions of the Spark running on the same Kubernetes. That's a great feature. And the CNCF ecosystem. So now you want to monitor uh, your Spark jobs and you want to create dashboards and you want to uh, you know, extract the logs and CNCF ecosystem comes with a lot of open source um, uh, add-ons which you can leverage to uh, build a good ecosystem on a full data pipeline. And cost optimization, so all of these features actually drives the cost optimization compared to other, you know, the traditional way of running on Hadoop, uh, a Spark on Hadoop, uh, just mainly the auto-scaling portability and multi-tenancy. Right, this is a simple uh, uh, command like Spark Submit. So it's no different from how you run on Hadoop. And if you see the master URL points to the KHU API server. So if you want to run your Spark job and using this command, you can run it on your local machine um, and, and then points to the KH server that can be any EKS or any other cl Kubernetes cluster and, and the job will run. Let's, let's dig into how the job that runs on Kubernetes. So this is, uh, this is the internals of how you can run Spark on Kubernetes, so like in how it works when you submit a job. As you see on the, on the left-hand side, we have Kubernetes control plane and the right-hand side, Kubernetes data plane. So when you submit your Spark submit from your local machine or from Airflow or any other schedulers, and the job will be submitted to an API server and an API scheduler will schedule the driver part. That is the first step. Uh, once the driver part is created, but it's not showing there, uh, even there's a headless service also created along with the driver part. And the driver part will request scheduler to, will request API server to schedule the executors. So uh, how many of our executors? And the scheduler will schedule those executors to, you know. And once these executors start running, uh, and these executors will, will make a connection to the driver using that headless service. That's how the driver communicates with the executors and send the tasks down to the executors and the jobs will run within individual executors. So that, that's how Spark on Kubernetes works, uh, pretty much uh, the communication end to end. But now, as you see here, this is a, a YAML file, this is a Spark operator, but within Kubernetes world, um, everything that we want to run in a YAML declarator way, right? So, what we have seen before is a Spark submit is a simple JSON config with a CLI command, but rather you want to define your Spark jobs in a simple YAML file with you know, the job name and as you see here, the driver course and executor course and number of executors that you need. So it, this simplifies the whole process of running a Spark job. So I can just simply write this job and then use kubectl to apply and that goes and runs your Spark job on Kubernetes, right? So how to uh, get to this point and how do we actually uh, um, you know, leverage Spark Operator? Let's talk about a bit more about Spark Operator. So Google uh, has created this uh, new Kubernetes operator for Spark to simplify that process. So what it does differently from Spark Submit, let's take a look at this one here. So you have, they created two uh, 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 CRDs, which is Spark Application and Scheduled Spark Application. And it comes with four main components. One is controller, submission job runner, and Spark pod monitor, and then mutating admission web hook. So it's basically a controller, uh, which will uh, look for the Spark application object YAML that you have seen before. And then controller will ask the Spark submission, uh, submission job runner to 
actually submit the job. And submission job runner, what it does is, it converts that YAML into a Spark submit, assembles into a Spark submit, and then submits to Kubernetes API server. That's, which is similar to what you've seen with the Spark submit. So even Spark operators leveraging Spark submit behind the scenes. Once a job is submitted, and Spark operator does it in, uh, differently in two things. One is Spark pod monitor and the mutating admission webhook. So once a job is submitted, uh, you might need some storage. I mean, you know, mounting the volumes or mounting configuration maps and so on. So mutating admission webhook is responsible. Before the pod is persisted, it goes and creates the volumes and it mounts the volumes and, you know, and ensure the pod is created with all the volumes. And the Spark, uh, Spark pod monitor, this ensures the status of driver status, executor status, and keeps informing to the controller saying the job is running. So if in any case of the job is failed, and the controller can restart the job. So that's how the operator works, and which is more a simplified way than the Spark submit. But underneath, it uses the Spark, su Spark submit. Right, so um, the scaling Spark and Kubernetes are some of the common challenges that we, when we work with the customers, they come back and say, hey, uh, we tried Spark and Kubernetes, but when, when it comes to scaling, when we go beyond 200 nodes and even 1,000 nodes, and we, we, hit, we hit all sorts of issues, and what kind of consideration we need to take, and high availability consideration, what kind of logging and monitoring that we need to build when we run Spark and Kubernetes, and choosing the right compute and storage, and what kind of network configurations that we need to define and do we need to use specific bash schedulers to run the job? So let's talk about some of those best practices uh, that we talked about, uh, the, some of the challenges that we talked before. Um, as you see here in this diagram that we have um, VPC CNI, I'm not sure how many of you heard, the networking within EKS, we use VPC CNI um, uh, within AWS, but uh, the similar networking will be um, available in other cloud providers as well. So with the VPC CNI, we use a pod networking. So, so when it comes to running Spark and Kubernetes and you want to run 50,000 pods, you need 50,000 IPs. So which means you might hit, uh, you might have heard, um, you know, we've hit IP exhaustion issues. So to avoid IP exhaustion issues, and one of the main consideration or recommendation would we do is create two, uh, uh, use a non-routable IP secondary side of range to create uh, two large subnets and each comes with a 65,000 IPs. So in this architecture, you can go up to 120,000 parts running on within the same EKS cluster if you want to run a large scale. And then the future, the next step is, hey, uh, we want to try IPv6. I know we, uh, secondary side of range is an option, but um, this is something that we are looking at in the future where the customers move to the IPv6 and it's a lot easier uh, to work with. So Kubernetes from version 1.23, it supports IPv6 and even Spark 3.4.0 added a support for IPv6 as well. So all that you need to do is the configuration that you see here when you submit the job and that allows you to leverage IPv6 and avoids IP exhaustion. You have a, you know, uh, the large number of ports that you want to run within the same Kubernetes cluster. Right, so this is one of the common issue when it comes to the core DNS. Um, like if you're running a large scale uh, Spark and Kubernetes and the first thing you might see an error, something related to unknown host exception. It's because uh, the nature of the Spark is a bursty workload. So you go and hit 10,000 parts and trying to spin up and trying to communicate with each other and, and putting a pressure on the core DNS. So to avoid that, we recommend using cluster proportional autoscaler with the core DNS, which means when you're uh, Kubernetes cluster is growing, uh, and your core DNS pods horizontally scales to support that uh, the large scale Kubernetes cluster. And then we also recommend using node local DNS caching, which is basically uh, uh, you know having a cache in every single node so that it doesn't need to make DNS resolution call to the core DNS pods. Uh, it can refer to the local caching and reduces that amount of calls that makes the core DNS and improves the performance for the large scale Kubernetes clusters. And finally, the pod anti-affinity, just make sure that you don't run uh, more than two, you know, more than one pod within the same node, and these core DNS pods are actually spread across all the nodes rather than running everything in a single node. 
Right, so one of the key uh, important feature here is uh, the storage. When it comes to the Spark, um, you know, you think about storage. And it's a, what kind of storage that we need to use. And we highly recommend using NVMe SSD based volumes uh, because Spark is a nature, it does a lot of shuffling. Um, and NVMe based SSD volumes, as you see, this is part of the ECT instance itself. Like uh, when user, uh, when the Spark job runs, it goes and pulls the data from S3 bucket into that NVMe SSD, and these executors can, uh, uh, you know, work with the data quite quickly without having to, you know, without having any latency. So this gives you high throughput, low latency, uh, you know, the uh, performance for the Spark jobs. But you also have another option where you can leverage the block, block storage, which is EBS volumes as well. But uh, the only difference here is you get a variable throughput because EB, um, the volume is external to the EC2 instance and you have, a, uh, and the EBS bandwidth uh, ba varies based on the EC2 instance that you choose, the smaller instance and the larger instance. And, but it also comes with other features like reusing persistent volume claim. Like when you wanted to leverage, re reuse the persistent volume claim is a feature within Kubernetes where if one of the node dies uh, for some reason, um, you know, even if the node dies and the pod gets killed, uh, you can still keep the, uh, the, the volumes that are connected to that old node and reuse those volumes with the new node that comes up. So basically it doesn't need to recompute, it can use where it is started. Give it to me. Yep, you wanna? Yeah. Thank you. Hey. Now, what options do we have when, uh, when we're running from the uh, compute options, when you're running the Spark on the Kubernetes? When you are deploying the Spark on Kubernetes, the executor can be scheduled on the spot instances and the driver on the on-demand instances. And they, this in re scheduling the executors on the spot instances, this enables the faster results by scaling and executors running uh, on it. And there is also another way, because it, it, another reason, because if a, po if a driver pod, it, it will be run on the spot instances and the spot instances gets terminated, then the, the whole application fails and have to be resubmitted. While if they, that's why we recommend that the driver should be always installed on the on-demand instances. The executors though, even if the, the spot instances get terminated, the resiliency from the Spark, the driver, will create a new executor once a, a new spot instance is, it is, uh, it is being created. And like this, and like this, you achieve the, uh, also the, the cost efficiency and uh, uh, within your cluster. While running Spark on the, uh, on the Kubernetes, you can experience challenges uh, with the scalability and performance. But with the Carpenter, uh, the Spark clusters can quickly, can be quickly scaled and dynamically. And in the same time, you uh, and the, the workloads meets the, the need that they want to. And in the same time, you achieve the resource availability and the cost efficiency with, with it. And Carpenter is coming also with some, uh, in, uh, some in, uh, features, in, improvements to workload consol consolidation, deprovisioning, network node termination, and further improving the efficiency and the uh, cost savings. Apache Unicorn that you'll see actually in our demo, uh, it's a batch scheduler purposely built for the Kubernetes uh, and usually used into uh, big data and ML uh, workloads. And it is particularly useful for Kubernetes with applications like, uh, with the features like application aware scheduling, where it is it recognize the users, the applications, and the, the queues, the scheduling of, uh, according with the uh, submission order. It has also gang scheduling for the pod placement, and you will see uh, you will see this also in the demo, and a hierarchy queues for built in for uh, optimized Spark performance. Um, for the logging, Fluent Bit um, uh, Kubernetes filter allow you to enrich your log files with Kubernetes metadata. And if you are using the filters, you are seeing the, the fil uh, uh, FluentB filter, uh, extra filter config, um, you can get the metadata uh, uh, from with, uh, with Kubelet instead of um, querying the API. It's very specific, very useful in when you have large clusters because you don't put pressure on the API anymore. Sorry. 
one more. All right. Oh, now, getting into the Argo workflow, uh, this is a DAG orchestrator. The workflow engineer is the best way to run Kubernetes um, uh, because it is built for Kubernetes. All right. It is very uh, popular and very useful when you're running uh, uh, ETL workloads or training jobs, and you can orchestrate deployments and then use it in your DevOps and uh, CD pipelines with Argo workflows. And the Argo workflows, it can be integrated with Argo events, and Argo events will, will fetch any event source, uh, whatever it is, Kafka, Slack, uh, web, different webhooks, you name it. And you will see also in, in our example, when we'll have like an external, re, external source that will trigger an event and consequently an workflow and a job. And this is actually what I'm going to show you to you in the demo today. So in the demo, we created an Amazon EKS cluster and installed the Argo workflows in the Argo events in their dedicated namespaces, as you can see on the screen, Argo events and Argo, Argo, name, uh, uh, Argo workflows. Uh, in the same time as an, an outside source, okay, we, cre we, we have an Amazon SQS queue that is created to receive requests from users. And the, and the SQS event source that you're gonna, you'll see it in the Argo events namespace object, okay, that is set up to fetch the events from that uh, SQS queue. That event can come from any like S3 put object notification, not necessarily from users, yes. uh, which triggers. Interest. This is only for the, uh, that we choose for the demo purposes. The sensors runs and waits for the certain condition to be made. Okay, and we will go through the, how the sensor is built. And when the, the message is received by the event source, uh, the sensor sees it and creates a workflow. And the workflow through the Spark operator um, uh, create a, a Spark job and uh, on, in the um, Spark team a uh, namespace. And obviously, Vara mentioned earlier the multi-tenancy so you can do like that in separate namespaces. It allows you to build that end-to-end -end data pipeline using Argo workflows, and, and you can drive those data pipelines using Argo events in this case, and you have Spark operator, Prometheus, and Unicorn sit in the, within the same Kubernetes cluster. Um, okay. So, yeah. And now I am gonna jump to the demo. Okay, as you can see here. Uh, Right. We can so, kick off the demo first, and then we can talk about. Yes, uh, I will. I will start because it takes two minutes for the for the job. Okay, and then I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna tell you exactly what I did. All right. Yeah. Okay. While all we do is uh, triggering this job, and it's basically uh, just simple YAML configuration that uh, you can define the whole DAG uh, in a YAML file using Argo workflows. And you can build the most complex Argo workflow, similar to you might be using Airflow for scheduling your data and ML jobs. And now, Kubernetes uh, Argo workflow is a very lightweight workflow engine. is more powerful that you can build your end-to-end -end data pipelines and include the ML pipelines, part of the data pipelines, and and use Argo workflows as your you know native engine to run your jobs. So. And all that you will be doing is defining um, uh, simple YAML files. In this case, there is a sensor YAML file that Ovidu is going to show you uh, in a minute once the job is triggered. Yeah. Allow me to trigger the job, and then we'll come back to you and then show you to what exactly what I did. So we have SQSQ created. Um, is going to send a message uh, to an SQSQ to invoke that pipeline. One second, if, to make sure that I have the variables in place, and yeah, it's all good. I didn't copy the whole okay. part of it. Let's make it more interesting. Yeah, so um, I 
I think it, when it comes to the production that okay. we have these workflows. So yeah. the, the message from the, and now I can increase it a bit again. The message from the SKS was sent. And we should have a workflow triggered. Yeah, it's here. And we can see that on the web UI, which is Argo workflow web UI here. If you can okay. expand that a little bit. Yes. And until, until, let me, let me get bigger. That's the sensor. That's um, the sensor. And need to log in again on this one, I think. Yep. One second. Argo workflows provides a really nice UI that you can expose that UI using Nginx and or backed by any, uh, application load balancer or a network load balancer um, and set up AD authentication with your own LDAP configuration to make it okay. more accessible. So our, our, uh, our event source is SQS Spark workflow, okay, was uh, met the dependencies for the, uh, uh, for the sensor and created a, a Spark workflow. And this one, it is just happening right now, as you can see. Okay, so make it a bit bigger for you. All right, okay. And th the workflow has several parallel jobs. So one job, it was the, some simple job, hello world job. And from this, two, from this job, okay, another two jobs has been created. And at the end, uh, a bigger one. And you will see that in, this, uh, uh, in the same time, because I'm gonna move to the CLI, when the pods are being created into the Spark team main namespace, and also in the same time, the carpenter will provision the nodes for the driver and also the spot instances for the executors. Behind the scenes, it is using Unicorn as a gang scheduling. Uh, it's using Carpenter to scale your nodes. So basically, you have an cl empty cluster, just a Kubernetes cluster running. And once you trigger the job, uh, which is Augur Workflows, and it goes and spins up the nodes and runs your Spark job and then scale it down to zero. Okay. And this is the event source, okay, that is running into Argo events namespace and is looking for the uh, 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 events that are uh, to fetch from uh, Amazon SQS. And then this is the sensor and I'll go briefly through it with you. And the sensor has, is triggering the Argo workflow here, as you can see. And this one has par several parallel jobs. One, hello, two hello world jobs and one Spark operator job, of more complex jobs. The jobs in, the, in this Spark operator uh, uh, jobs, they have the driver that needs to be installed with the, uh, through the Carpenter on on-demand distances, as you can see in here. And in the same time, it is, and the unicorn will take, take care about the scheduling. And in the same time, the executors, with, the executors will be installed on the spot instances. And the same is happening for the bigger job. But because I measure it, and it takes exactly two minutes, okay? And I, have, I think I'm already talking for two minutes about this thing. So we should have these things happening here. So if I click, if I click the EKS node viewer, yes, all right. So these are the, the first three nodes, okay? They are the core nodes where the system is running. And the carpenter created one node, on-demand node for the driver, and two additional nodes where the executors are running, okay? If I'm gonna, if I'm gonna watch this into the Spark, uh, Spark Team A namespace, okay? I see that the first driver, the, the, uh, the first driver into this workflow, this one from here, Spark Operator uh, PI job, has, it is running already and the executors are being created on the, on the spot instances, okay? While the second job, the Spark Operator Taxi job, is waiting to finish the Spark Operator PI job, okay? And then to start running, running again. And yeah. the, the executors from the, from the first one is terminating and the, the, uh, the, the last job is being created as well. Yeah, I think we are near to the time. Uh, sorry, we took uh, longer than that. But if you have any quick questions, uh, we can take a couple of questions if you have. 
Yep. Go probably on, take please. one question and then and sorry then can, they can can they find you yeah. somewhere yeah yeah okay yeah, yeah. that'll be good uh, we'll be standing outside so my question is does anybody actually use an ipv6 uh that's a good question um there's a lot of customers are experimenting ipv6 at the moment uh it's because even though spark submit supports uh, there are other components which does not have support for ipv6 so it's mainly validating what other tools or add-ons that you want to run on Kubernetes, whether that supports IPv6 or not. Say, for example, Spark Operator uh, does not support IPv6. Because of that reason, customers are waiting until that support is available. So, so we're thinking about that's a feature, but once we have that, you know, we are going towards that way. Yeah. 